Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever time of day it is. Thank you for tuning in to Conversations with Dr. Don. The show you're watching, Conversations with Dr. Don, uh, has been on uh, about 17 years, and uh, it's produced and broadcast from Portland, Oregon, USA. And it's an ongoing series of one-hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people, like most of you out there, about who they are as unique, one-of-a-kind individuals and about whatever it is we've decided to talk about. And my guest this evening is Felix Lilly, quite an interesting character, as you'll find out by, before the hour is out. And uh, I met you at the Saturday market in Portland. Yes. And a hug day, right? Yes, it was hug day. And you seemed to stand out from the crowd, and I thought, you're very interesting, I'm sure. And then a few questions, and I thought, well, for sure i got to have you on the show. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, yeah. As you know, the show goes, the first uh, segment can be 15 minutes or 40 minutes, depending on how interesting you are. Okay. And then the second uh, part of the show will be uh, the fall and what, yes. what, what, what can, that, that has done for that. you. Yeah, we'll talk about that. And uh, how are you feeling right now? I'm feeling really good right now. I had a good day. I, of course, it was a busy day, but it's been a good day in general. Uh -huh. Good last couple months of my life, I've been doing well with my everyday activities, so that's always good. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've got some interesting activities to talk about. Yes. And you've been uh, okay with life uh, for the past uh, month, a week or so, or what? Yes, yes. Very good. All right. So, let's talk about and ask some questions that seem rather personal and kind of, but not too pro probing or prying. Okay. And if you don't want to answer a question, you can say, I don't want to answer or get lost or something. Okay. And we'll see where that goes. And uh, um, so, if I were to ask your best friend, who is Felix? What would your best friend say? Be your best friend. Felix is what? A who? Um, a musician, and be your best friend. Do it in that. Oof, my best Felix friend. Felix is your best friend. Is saying, or some good friend of yours. And ask, who is Felix? Answer my question. Felix is. I, well, my best friend would say, uh -huh. I'm a helper and I'm a musician. Uh, I play the piano, so I remember. Yes, that that's really helpful to a lot of other people because the music I play is so tranquil and it it calms them so much and it, that helps a lot of people and I play at the hospital a lot sometimes because that's meaningful to me. What hospital? Um, I play at Randall Children's Hospital and Emanuel Hospital. Sometimes I play at the Oregon Health Science University, OHSU. How often do you do that? Mm, uh, uh, roughly? Roughly Every month, once a month, I'm going to start volunteering more regularly at Randall Children's Hospital at the end of the month. Actually, next week is my one of my uh, orientation trainings. Uh huh. What does that do for you? Um, well, for me, volunteering at the hospital, I'm sure will, I'm sure will be very good for me because it will give me, it will give me the aspect to know that I'm helping people who really, really need my help because they don't have the opportunity to go out and get that help from another live musician or from, they don't get to go out very much. So yeah, when, I, when I do that for them, I feel like it's very good and it helps them out a lot. That's very commendable on your part. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, a couple of questions like that when we met you, when yes. we met, in Portland, I thought, boy, this guy is very interesting, so let's see how interesting you are. All right. So when and where were you born? I was born in Portland, Oregon, mm -hmm. um, May 6th, 1997. I turned 20 last month. 20? Yeah. God, wonderful. Crazy. Uh -huh. So I'm doing well. Yes, okay. yes, born and raised in Portland, uh -huh. and I still live in Portland. Mm -hmm. It's going good. Uh -huh. Are you living alone or with some family or what? I'm living with my family. Uh -huh. uh, rent's too expensive these days. <laughs> um, they, they cut down rent. It's not quite as much 
as it would be if I were li living by myself. They do charge me something, but not as much as it would be for a studio or apartment or whatnot. What do they do? 300 a month. What, do you, what does your family do to earn their keep? Oh, um, my dad's a writer. Uh, my mom's a counselor. Uh -huh. And my sisters are doing their own thing. I'm not 100% sure mm -hmm, that's what, okay. but yeah. they're still, they're doing okay. They're doing good. I got a trick question now and then to catch you off guard. Okay, okay. Uh, why were you born? Why was I born? Why does everybody repeat that question back to me? <laughs> <laughs> um, Tell me, why were you born? Well, I guess I was born, yeah. I was sent to this world because there's good that I know I need to do. And I'm figuring out still what that is. You said you were sent to this world. Who or what sent you? I've never been asked that question before. Uh huh. I told um, you I got trick questions. Trick questions, and, indeed. And when you leave here, you'll be still thinking about a few of the questions that I asked you. I'm sure. And you'll like it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Who? Well, goodness. Um, That's okay. My parents wanted a kid. Mm hmm. So. And they got you. Yes. <laughs> um, is there any significance about your racial or national or cultural heritage, or are you just plain American white bread? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm American, white bread. I'm also, my mom is from Germany, so mm -hmm. I do have some German descent in me, mm -hmm. which, is a really which is really helpful for me because I love traveling to Germany quite a bit and exploring Germany and identifying different parts of their culture. How often do you go back? Mm, these days, about every four years or three years, I go to Germany. Uh -huh. And you were born here in Portland? I was born here in Portland, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, do you have a religious preference? Not really, no. Mm -hmm, okay. And your formal education, it's, it's rough to ask you that as young as you are. How about your formal education? Anything of particular interest to our viewers about your formal education, your high school, and what else? Yes, I have quite a few um, interests in what I may want to pursue later in life. Um, in my high school, I studied nursing, um, and that gave me an insight as to what it would be like to work in the medical profession as a nurse or a doctor. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things I'm interested in. And nursing has, you're helping a lot of people as a nurse. So that's, like we were talking about earlier, helping people is a thing I like to do. So nursing might be a path I choose to go down. Mm -hmm. some, other, um, some other career paths I've thought through I may want to be a musician more into the big field. Um, there's uh, tons of opportunity for musicians. I was so impressed with you on the keyboards. <laughs> Thank it's you. Important, yeah. Yes. I've been practicing the keyboard for uh, most of my life, and I like to think I'm doing pretty well on the keyboard. I also play the pipe organ, uh -huh. so that's going well. And when I had said that I may be interested in a musical career, I may want to travel and play pipe organ worldwide because that would be a fun thing to do. And, and thousands of people love listening to the music that the pipe organ makes. Of course, I do, I do too, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. I'm just thinking now for a moment about what the future might hold for you as the years go by. Mm -hmm. And you check out these different things you mentioned and see where you're gonna go. And my hunch is you'll be going in more than one direction. You're so full of yes. things. How is it you got to be so caring about uh, humans' welfare and those kinds of things? Um, well, actually, 10 years ago, I fell out of a tall tree and I injured, I injured a good part of my body. I broke my wrist and my leg and I fractured my skull. I had a, some compound fractures and that sent me into a coma for three weeks. Oh my God. And I received, I, other people donated their bodily fluids, their blood and their plasma to me so that I could survive. Mm -hmm. And I did survive and that has gotten me into helping people. 
I, at the Red Cross, speaking of blood and plasma and platelets, I go to the Red Cross pretty regularly and donate platelets because I know that for the burned victims and for, for the patients, the patients with chronic diseases or the young kids, the young kids who, with cancer, they need the platelets from me sure. so that they have a chance to survive and thrive on for the rest of their life. Did you get to be the way you are because of the fall or was it, was it inherited somewhat from your parents? I would say mostly from the fall. Okay. When I, when I woke up from the fall, from my coma, when I woke up, I had, I had a, a, a bigger appreciation for life and I held much more gratitude in my soul. And that unleashed tremendous power and it, it unleashed, yes, tremendousness. We'll get in, into more of that in the yes, second half yes. of the show. Okay. It is. A, a, and you talked about what you've been doing now in your life for the most part. Mm -hmm. Do you have a partner, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, or a wife, or a husband, or one of those? You've got to cover all the bases. <laughs> Too here. young for a wife. <laughs> <laughs> Too young for a wife quite yet. <laughs> yeah, I don't actually have any partners. Um, I spend most of my time by myself playing my music and um, wandering around to the hospitals or donating just to help people. So I had a partner, but she she went her separate way a few months ago. Yeah. I would like us to stay in touch as time goes by. Yes. So I want to know yes. what's going on with you. And you're interesting and you're unique enough where it's not ordinary stuff I'm getting from you. So I'll be asking you some probing questions. But I won't be in my psychologist hat. I'll be just okay. be my interviewer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, do, you self, do you see yourself as political at any kind? Anyway, left or right or centrist or what? Um, Are you apolitical? I guess I'm just neutral with politics. I'm not really too involved in what happens. I just kind of go with the flow, you know, whoever's president. I know that he has his ups and downs, but I'm not going to go into too much detail about that tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I try not to try not to spend my time focused in on what politicians are doing and what's going around uh -huh. in that um, realm of things. I try to stay, I try to keep my mind focused in on what is important to me Yes. as opposed to what other people are doing. So can you say a few more words about what is important to you besides those things that you mentioned? Or maybe nothing more comes to mind right now. What's important to you? Well, yes, like I had said, helping people is very important yes. to me. Yes. Um, my music is very important to me. Um, my family is really important to me. They've been a, a really big impact on my life, especially when I was recovering from my fall. Yeah. So what were you doing in Portland on that Hug Sunday? Say a few words about uh, hug Day on, on Sunday, once a year, around the world. Uh, people meet to get together at different uh, public uh, gatherings and hug each other a lot and hug strangers. Mm -hmm. And I go every year and uh, have a good time doing it. Yes. And I always smile for a day, for a week <laughs> after. <laughs> I smiled a lot after that, too. I was just going down to the Saturday, to market. The Saturday market before work and I stumbled upon you, and I thought, hmm, he seems like a nice guy. Why don't I give him a hug? So I did, and then I started talking with you, and one thing led to another, and now we're here. And then there was this little kid who was uh, a young kid playing the piano, and yes, he was yes. collecting uh, donations like that. Yes. And he turned his head one way, and then pretty soon you were sitting there and playing his keyboard. <laughs> I said, was. who is this guy? <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, uh, you're pretty young. How about, uh, do you think of any persons uh, from the past or alive today that you particularly admire or uh, look up to? And maybe you don't have that just yet, but if any names come to mind for you? Uh, yes, um, oh. a few names. Um, Daniel Barenboim is a big in influence for me. He conducted orchestras and has been doing an amazing job at that. 
um, and other Daniel Barenboim, other musicians, uh, Long Long is an influence to me. Um, and people, authors who have written good works, I look up to. Um, some teachers and who I respect, I look up to and um, Any names come to mind that I would recognize or that the viewers might recognize? And maybe not. That's okay. Any names come to mind that you might recognize? Mm -hmm. um, That's okay. Not You're awfully young, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let us take kind of an early break now because you want to spend some time in the fall and the consequences okay. of that. Okay. Can we take an early break, Mr. E? Okay, we're back. Thanks for staying tuned. And for you viewers who missed the opening of the show, Conversations with Dr. Don that you're watching is an ongoing series of one-hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people like my guest here tonight about who he is and what he's interested in and what, he, what he'll be talking about to me. And this is my standard opening, and I always blow it. And that's when I'm smiling at myself. <laughs> I never mind. But anyhow, let's go into the second part of the show. Yes. The experience of the fall. And we'll talk about that for a moment. Yeah. Experience of the fall. Here we go. Will you talk a little, about, little bit about the fall? What does that mean, the experience of the fall? Yes, I think we can find better words to say other than the experience of the fall. Basically, 10 years ago, I, ha I fell out of a tree, and the experience of the fall is my recollection on what happened during that insane part of my life. Of course. So, I guess... I can start talking about it. Yeah, whatever comes to mind. All right, start from the beginning. Sure. June 2nd, 2007, I was at Laurelhurst Park with one of my sister's friends. She was having a birthday party. Laurelhurst Park is Laurelhurst in Portland? Park, yes, it is in Portland. Mm -hmm. And we, it was just, we were having fun. I was 10 years old at the time, and we were running around, playing badminton, um, eating snacks, playing tag, climbing trees. And I climbed a tree because I used to do that a lot in my youth. And to my demise, 30 feet or 28, 27 feet, 30 feet, somewhere around there in, in that, the tree. That high? Maybe 26, 27. Whoa. But between like there and 30 feet, the branch broke and I actually fell all the way down to the ground and I landed on the ground so hard that I broke my my femur and my wrist and my skull fractured as well which was which was I mean I was knocked unconscious immediately but for my family they they were extremely scared of course um and a bit a little short ladder of the land here at the picnic area where the party was at, when it was me and my friends and my sister, we were all running around. My dad and my other sister, Saskia, they walked down to a pond, which was about a third of a mile away from the picnic area. So when I fell out of the tree, they didn't know that it was happening until 
they were actually beckoned back to the picnic area from the sounds of the sirens from the ambulance and the paramedic truck. Because the pond was They didn't know that you had... They didn't know that I had fallen. My sister, she was running around with me and all our other friends. I climbed to the tree. I fell out of the tree. My sister was standing right by the side of the tree. And she saw me fall out of the tree. And then she called to my dad, but he was too far away to hear her. So, and he was focused in on spending time with my other sister, Saskia. So they didn't head back toward the party. But then a couple minutes later, when the paramedics showed up and the sirens and the fire truck, my dad heard the sirens uh -huh. and he thought, hmm, maybe we should go investigate and see what the ambulance or fire truck is doing it in the park. So Was that two, three, four minutes or what? How, what's the guest of it? I don't know. Oh, it's that's okay. Two, three, four minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and then they were wandering back to the park and once my dad was within hearing distance of Hana, my, my the first sister, Hana, then he picked up, then he ran as fast as he could with Saskia to my side and he started praying for me because Literally, that was all he could do. When I was laying bloody and broken under the tree, all he could do for me was pray for me because he, he couldn't put bandages on me and he couldn't put me back together mm -hmm. since I was broken and I needed to be in a hospital and under supervision and care and I needed time to recover and have my bones heal back together and all my nervous systems get back in line oh with one another. God, yeah. So all he could do was pray for me and he had to put his fate into God's hands or into whoever's hands. He had no control over my destiny. You know, at that point, he had no idea. He just said, please stay alive. He, he of course, he told me to keep breathing, and he said I would be okay. Do you remember hearing that? He wrote a book. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, he had no, he couldn't do anything at that point. And then he w got in the hospital with me, and we drove up to, I think, Dornbecker Children's Hospital, or OHSU was one of the first hospitals I stayed in. That was in Portland? Yes, in Portland. Oregon Health Sciences University. That is correct. Yeah. And, and then I was put into the hospital, into the triage room, and then through there into the surgery room. I don't really know all the details because I was out cold at this point. Mm -hmm. um, but I know that, I know that at some point a few days after I had had my fall, the doctor came in and told my parents that he thought I was going to die. And so I, have, I had a really, really little chance to survive because the doctors had thought that I was going to die and a lot of other people in the community, they didn't know if I was going to make it. So they were sending me prayers, you know, at their dinner table for dinner or just they were writing me get well cards and sending me flowers and brownies and cherry pies. And you were out of it. I was, I was out of it. I, mi I missed that whole part. I was in my, <laughs> <laughs> I was in a coma for that whole part. But when I woke up, I was, it was a really slow recovery. I woke up really slowly. It, and then as I started to be able to recall the events and the things that had happened, my dad told me that all these people from all around Portland and all around my community had made me these cards and had gotten me these flowers and had made me altars and were praying for me and had gotten gotten me candles and just a, a number of diff, uh, a number of different things that nice people in the community friends and family and friends of friends and people who knew my mom from a yoga class or their friend or whatever they all heard about me and they were all sending me good vibes and prayers and helping me. You think that helped? I definitely think that helped. <laughs> I definitely think that helped. Uh -huh. And I, I think a lot that if, if no one would have heard about my fall or no one would have sent me prayers, you know, I may, I may not have made it. Or if the park was out in a more rural location, like further away from a fire station in a ambulance like in a further away from a hospital then it would have taken longer for the paramedics to get to my aid and I probably wouldn't have made it 
So I think back quite often just on how lucky I am to have to still be around and still be alive after such a traumatic event. And things <coughs> happen to you as a result of that traumatic event that has uh, invited you to explore the things that you mentioned earlier on and what you're doing in your life now. I wonder the things you're doing in your life now, like music and yet the, the good deeds you're doing with people who need your help, your human help, uh, would those be in existence now in you were it, were it not for the fall, uh, the injuries you suffered? Would you have been the same way, same interest now had you not had the fall? Honestly, there's no way I can tell that answer. Of course you can't. <laughs> <laughs> um, I assume not because I, when I fell, I, it opened me up to a, a huge, it opened me up to a huge understanding that there are thousands of people who need help and who need my, who need platelets to, so they can survive. That opened me up to that. And then I think that my fall was one of the reasons that I actually started donating platelets. Mm -hmm. And if I wouldn't have fallen, there's really no say on what I would be doing right now. I assume I would be playing piano still as I started playing before my fall and then continued through music therapy. Music therapy, remind me to talk about that later. Of course. Um, but if I hadn't had my fall, I would likely still be a musician, but honestly there's no way I can tell because my life was going and then it forked off to the side. And if it would have kept going on that straight line, then no one, I, there's no way to tell where I would be or what I would be doing right now. Mm -hmm. So the music therapy was, made an impression on you that you want to be sure to talk about it. Yes, a, yes. A, during our conversation. You want to talk about it now or shall I ask you some more questions? Either way. Mm. Go ahead, start now. Okay. The music therapy. <laughs> the music therapy was amazing because for me when I was in the hospital and I had my, my accident, I had to relearn how to do everything. I was in a wheelchair with breathing tubes and I had a feeding tube and a bunch of IVs. Oh, man. And, you know, saline solution and everything was, I was just, I needed to relearn how to be, how to be. I, I couldn't, I couldn't be myself. I, I couldn't do things myself. I had, like I said, I was in a wheelchair. I had respirators and heart monitors and that all those intense machines and um your brain was still working and your heart was still working and your 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 core your tap root was tap root was uh, essentially intact and the, those are the things that are essential to being alive yes and i was very extremely lucky when i fell um i asked my dad on June 2nd, 2008, one year after I fell, we went actually back to Laurelhurst Park in Portland and he showed me the tree and he showed me where I fell. And he told me that my head landed a centimeter away from a big root. So if I would have landed a centimeter on the root, I could have gotten a lifelong concussion and would be brain dead right now. Mm -hmm. So that is for me i'm so glad that that didn't happen are you pretty much recovered from the physical injury from the physical injury yes i am pretty much recovered i have had all my surgeries my hand my wrist surgery my leg surgery um i had tachycardia so i had a heart surgery a few really? years ago i did that was actually very scary I had a few onsets of tachycardia um, actually during my middle school classes. So I had to excuse myself and take care of my heart. And I was at the pool. I was at Selwood Pool in Portland one time mm -hmm. with one of my friends in 2009. And I had tachycardia, I got an onset then. I actually had to go to the hospital for that for a few hours or overnight or something. And then I've, I've had the ablation, though, since then, so that's 
stopped my tachycardia from happening. The oblation? The oblation, yes. What is that? It was a, it was a heart surgery where they went in and they cauterized part of my heart oh. that was causing it the rapid heartbeat. Man. It was a closed heart surgery. It wasn't an open heart surgery. Uh -huh. So they went in through an artery or a vessel or a vein, I don't know what it was, and they cauterized a tiny part of my heart. And apparently that was like an eight hour procedure. So, I mean, I don't know, that's just what I've heard. <laughs> of course it was, oh, I'm awake, it's over for me. But <laughs> you anticipate him in next dumb question. Do you remember that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I remember going into it Going, you know, in, into the hospital, I, they'd lay me on the gurney. So they put on this gown, I'd say, okay, put on the gown. They'd say, lay on the bed, all right, so I'd lay on the bed. And then they said, all right, uh, can we examine you and, like, take you into the room? And then I was like, I don't know, can you? <laughs> Just to play around, you know? <laughs> and then when I was waking up, I did some more playing around. I, I, when the nurse came over, she's like, oh, how are you doing? Do you want some juice? I said, mother, is that you? Even though I knew it was the nurse. <laughs> <laughs> Just to play around with them, you know? You're a bear. I am. <laughs> Just to play around, you know? You gotta have some fun when you're in the hospital. I mean. Where'd you get that from, your dad or your mom, uh, that probably, playing around? <laughs> probably my dad, but there may be a combination in there of from course. generations down on my mother's side or my, I don't know. <laughs> do, they know you, do, do they know you're here this evening with me? I told them I was going on air, um, and I think they know I'm here with you tonight. Mm -hmm. Because I told them, but they don't listen full-heartedly to me sometimes because they're living their own lives. You're just and, a kid. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> um, and... Yeah, I told them that I would be here. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much attention they were paying to me at the time. Because, of course, like I said, they are busy with their own lives and trying to stay on task and not fall off the horse with whatever in they're doing. Yeah, and when this is all done and processed, it's going to be on YouTube probably a couple of three days from now. Okay. And it'll be seen around the world if people want to do it some She's for some other location. And then I'll have a master DVD for you to oh, sit with the grand. family. Yes. And uh, this will be quite historic for you. Uh, I'm sure. And when I have years down the road, I can show my kids or my grandkids, you know. This is how I got to be this way. And back in the day, <laughs> I sat with Dr. Dawn and we had this talk, yeah. you know, like when I'm 90 or old, older. That's close to me. Don't, don't talk about age anymore. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> oh, anything more you can volunteer from your thoughts and memories so far, or should I look at your notes here? Oh, no, I can talk more about my fall. I have quite a bit of, um, quite a bit of interesting things to talk about in regards to that. Yes. Um, the night before my fall, June 1st, 2007, I actually had a piano recital. Mm -hmm. And I played some Mozart for my, for my performance. And that was only a mere 18 hours before I was completely oh. unconscious in the ambulance going to the hospital. And during my piano recital on June 1st, 2007, I had no idea that a day and a half later, I would be in the situation I was in, unconscious, in an ambulance, at the hospital, in the triage room. I had no idea that was in line for me. Right. So that happened, and... The fates. Yes, yes, and one of the, one of the, um, one of the mantras I go by a lot is, bad things happen quickly, good things take time. For me to fall from that tree really only took a couple seconds because gravity really took its toll. And then my entire recovery process has t took years and years because I was in the hospital and then that took a long time and then I had to, I was an outpatient and I had acupuncture and that took a long time to get through all my surgeries and to get through everything I needed to get through took a long time. How about the expense? Was uh, the 
insurance to your parents or, or, or what? Ah, uh, yes. Did it affect their finances? Uh, uh, was the insurance pretty adequate to take care of your needs? Uh, I mean, I think it affected them. They had a lot of co-payments or yeah. whatever payments, but th we did have insurance, so health insurance. And they decided to keep you, huh? Well, no, I mean, not anymore. <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, back in those days, yeah, they kept me. They kept me until actually just last month I got my own insurance. Uh -huh. So, yes, but they had insurance for me, so I was all taken care of and well. Do you have enough income now to take care of your insurance needs? Yes. Man alive. Okay. <laughs> Living for me... It's a great time right now to be alive. Okay, why is that? Oh, there's so many amazing opportunities, you know. When I was in high school last year, one of my friends, he would every day, he would say, it's a great time to be alive. Every day he would say, it's a great day to be alive, no matter what day it was, on a Monday, a Tuesday, a Wednesday, just any day he would always say it was a great day to be alive. And it's still a great day to be alive today. You find that true for you today? Yes, I, I try to find that true for myself every day uh -huh. because in the long term, life is so short, so you really need to spend your life doing something you love doing and you need, you should really have gratitude in your life because if, if you don't have any gratitude in your life and if you don't do things that you find fun or plausible, then your life will pass you right by right before your eyes it'll pass you by right before your eyes and before you know it you'll be retired and too old to do most of or a lot of the fun things you wanted to do in your youth mm -hmm. i'm still doing fun things <laughs> <laughs> and i'm an old man okay <laughs> <laughs> and i'm listening to you and recalling my life a little bit now and then as we talk about talk about certain things and don't linger there long enough because I want to pay attention to you and experience you uh, more than uh, think about what we're talking about. There's something different going on uh, among human animals, I think, and it's way beyond what we're capable of defining and describing uh, in this neocortex, which is very primitive, mm -hmm. considering the overall idea of what else is going on. I alluded to it, I think, uh, by re referring to the tap root. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean by that? Yes. Yeah, of course. Boy, you've got a, quite a brain at 20 years old. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> you got any more stories about it? Um, yes. Mm -hmm. With the aspect of helping people, yeah. speaking of tap roots, actually, kind of a different system. But in high school, I was an outdoor school student leader. So over the course of three years, I helped uh, hundreds of sixth graders learn about the outdoors and I was in plants so I taught the kids about trees and the roots the main root is called the, there's the um, the tap root or it's the primary root and the secondary root and then the root hairs and there's the tap root is is a system of roots I can't if that survives then we can have yes and when you had mentioned tap root it just sprung back those happy psychological memories from when I was in outdoor school teaching those sixth graders how to have fun in the outdoors any of those little sixth graders come to mind now? Any stories about uh, them? Quite a few stories. You know, with each of the, with each of the sixth graders, a different story it just brings, a, a different story comes back to me. And over the years, I, those three years, I went to outdoor school and taught kids for three years. And it's a, I know that I made a huge impact on those children's lives. You know, I know that after they were done with their outdoor school experience, they went home and they told their parents about me and the things that I had taught them and they told their friends and they cherished the time spent, I hope, they cherished the time spent with me in their memories. I be bet they Because I, I cherish my time, cherish my time with those little sixth graders who are now seventh, eighth, and ninth graders and wherever schools in Portland or wherever else. But when they were sixth graders, I 
and I got to interact with them. I cherish each and every moment spent with every one of those kids. <laughs> you got, uh, let's see, we want to talk about uh, the breath and how the breath is the cosmic ah, center yes. of the entire universe. The cosmic center of yes. the entire universe. Let's talk about that. Yeah, well, I can talk about this for a while. Actually, a couple of weeks ago, I met, I met a, a, a friend at the Hollywood Transit Center, and we proceeded to go out to dinner later, and we were talking, and I said that, I told her that the breath is the cosmic center to the universe, because you could think of universe as, say, universe, three-part universe, or you can think about it as uni, Verse. Mm -hmm. Now think of an inhale and an exhale. Uni verse. The beginning of your life, the end of your life. See, it can be connected to, like, if you really think about it, it can go back a ways and it can be connected to a lot of things. You know, like the beginning of the day, the end of the day, and the evening and into the night. It can really be connected to a lot of things, the universe. Because and this is something else that I think about the universe. Mm -hmm. It, like it's, it's so vast and huge and we only, we've only discovered so much about it, but I personally think that it goes on forever, you know? I mean, I think there's still planets and galaxies that we haven't discovered yet. Um, but, um, yeah. Reincarnation, what do you think of reincarnation? That's a good topic, let's talk about that. Reincarnation, I do believe in reincarnation. Um, I am actually a writer myself. That was my, one of my questions I was saving for you. <laughs> okay, well you can save that question. <laughs> of course. But um, reincarnation, I do believe in reincarnation in a sense, past lives and future lives, I do believe in those. Um, also, it's, I think it's important to stay focused in on the life that you're living right now. Like I was saying earlier, sure. it, life is so short, you can't let it slip through your fingers. But um, if, like to put into a, to put into a, just a fantasy, like if you imagine, like an Im imagination, if you, if you imagine that your life is like a roller coaster ride, and when your life is just going like, okay, I'm living my life, it's just going at a straight, a straight line, you know, a continual line. Mm -hmm. And then when something good happens in your life, just imagine this, your roller coaster ride will go up and up and up because your life is like, yay, good things are happening. And then like when things go back to normal, they're like, okay, all right. Then it goes back to the, to the straight line. And then when things go really bad for you, then your roller coaster car will dip straight down. And I think that you could imagine your roller coaster car will continue going down until things start getting better for you. Then they'll straighten out again. And if they don't, then your roller coaster will go down forever until your heart stops beating and then it will hit bottom and burst into millions of microscopic fragments which will eventually settle and form new life. And in reincar with reincarnation, that I think could be like a way to think of it, you know? Like when you grow old and your time on this planet is done, then your body decomposes and it becomes a fertilizer for the soil so new plants can grow and feed a new a new species or people who don't have other food to eat, mm -hmm. if that Inter makes sense. Interesting description. <laughs> yeah. uh, in the moment, how often during the course of an average day for you do you linger in the moment? Do you simply be? and quiet this thing. That's a trouble for me. I'm still learning how to quiet the mind. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I try to spend at least a couple days a week just in the moment. I live a very chaotic life doing 
crazy things. So beautiful, crazy things. Beautiful, right? crazy yeah. things. Yes, and I, I, I try to spend at least a couple times a week, an hour or so, just not having to worry about anything. A few days ago. I had a morning free before I had to go to work since I worked the evening shift. Um, and actually what I did is I, I walked over to Laurelhurst Park and I lay down under the tree where I fell and I looked up into the branches 25, 30, 33 feet high where I had fallen from 10 years ago and I thought back to what had happened to me and I I thought oh my gosh and I could see what was happening through my dad's eyes and through my sister's eyes I can I can see what they saw in a sense because of what they've told me that they saw I can picture together what it was like for them they told me where I landed under the tree and how I was laying and where everything was and under the tree. And then the paramedics came in and took me to the hospital. But my, my dad, he told me everything and where I was laying and how it all unveiled. So I, when I was laying under the tree, I was actually laying in the same spot that I had fallen from. So it was good to be there alive 10 years later. Have you started your memoirs yet? Yes, I have. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Delightful. Um, my memoirs. So let's see, there has to be more than one memoir. Um, well, there's one main memoir that I actually started writing a few years ago. I think I may call it The Inadvertent Fall or Brusque Reality. Back in junior year of high school, I thought of some catchy titles, but I haven't focused on it. I'm working on writing some other books right now. But other books? Yes, yes. F fiction. Fiction okay. books. <laughs> I bet they'll be as fascinating I hope so. as the real uh, experience is. Um, and in the book that I wrote, The Inadvertent Fall, or whatever it's going to be called, um, it's from the first person. So it's, it's as this happened to me, this other thing invaded my life, and I could feel this happen as I went through this treatment or went through this dilemma. And actually, one of, the, one of the things I wrote down that I remember, I wrote this down when I was writing my book. As I fell, death beckoned me into its dark grail and lampooned at me as the seconds flew by. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, I was in honors English back when I wrote that, so it was kind of a homework assignment, but I turned it into some fun, so yeah, good times there. Uh, you said uh, when you go to work. Yes. And it, it, it earns you some money. It does. What kind of work? I am a dishwasher. I work at Toro Bravo which is a restaurant in Portland. Mm -hmm. um, there's Spanish food, not from Mexico, but from Spain. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very delicious food. There's a vast menu over there. And, and how long have you been there? Mm, since March, so four months about. They like you? They like me a lot, yeah, and I like them. There's great people there and it's, I really like it. And I think that I have an amazing opportunity to move up in the business. I don't want to, I don't really want to be a dishwasher forever. Uh, my you hope is to, <laughs> I mean, I can be a dishwasher now and then eventually become hopefully a prep cook, a line cook, a sous chef. And my goal is chef exec in, <laughs> in, in the restaurant industry. You know, I yeah. mean, if I can stay at it for that long, that would be my goal to become top of the notch, like world famous chef exec. I'm into like world famous things. Mm -hmm. Like an organ is a good way for me to get into that. Pipe organ is because not many people do that. <laughs> You're fascinating. <laughs> uh, reincarnation. Ah. Have you thought about what you may come back or who or 
what you may come back as in another incarnation uh, of a life on this planet. I want to come back as a, a Basenji, uh, a Labrador retriever, uh, bonobo. You familiar with a bonobo? Yes. Well, if yes, you know everything, your, your tender age is unreal. <laughs> <laughs> if I had my choice yes. in what I could be in my yeah, next choice. life, mm. I would probably want to be something beautiful, like a butterfly or uh, a beautiful barn owl or a. Uh, some owl or a butterfly, a beautiful animal, probably not a person. I think this lifetime for me being a person is enough. Um, a lifetime, that's the question because I'm thinking now with my human processing, my years seem like an awfully long time and considering the lifetime of a, a butterfly is gorgeous and perfect, its days are very brief. Doesn't that bother you to be a butterfly and have such a short life? I got the answer to my question as I pose it for you. No. <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say. No. I mean, one of the things that's interesting about being a butterfly is you get those couple days to be a butterfly, and that's it. You know, it's kind of, if you think about it, through the metamorphosis of a butterfly's life from an egg to a caterpillar and then into a butterfly, that's kind of like the life we're living. You're working really, really hard at something, and then after a long time, you finally achieve that goal. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I don't know where it came from. The window of the soul is in the person's eyes. To, to see when, you, when I'm with another human being, whatever they're saying, and all sorts of things are going on, and I'm processing what my senses are detecting, and then there's another sense that is an operation. And I think the result of that sense being an operation, along with the others in collaboration, I have a sense of you, and a, a sense of connectedness or distance or not being connected. And it's, 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 I'm, I'm talking about something I don't know about. I'm just guessing. I do know there's a result. There's a feeling I have. I am comfortable with you. Or, no matter what's going on with us, with, between us, even though we've been together for only an hour or so, as there's still not that degree of connection, for want of a better word. Mm. You know what I'm talking about? Um, sure. Uh, I guess I could say that maybe what you're saying is that, or let me, ref let me phrase it this way. Sure. From what you've told me, it sounds like you think that possibly in a past lifetime or in another time we were closer and in, you know, are spiritually connected. No, that is not what's on, what's on my mind. Oops. And, and, and it's interesting to speculate on, but what I was about is, is saying something about something that occurs between two human beings or between you and I that makes a lasting memory. And whatever else goes on is our, think about you and our time together there, there'll be something that was indefinable where I like you at that moment. That's a precious moment. There's a connection. It's, it's almost impossible to describe what I'm talking about. Uh, you're likable. There's so much about you that's interesting. And I'm considering if I would live again, I would like to have that kind of a life without falling on my head. Oh, now you're, yes. And you're, you're just starting your life really right now. Yes. And along the, with, with us talking about whatever we've talked about so far, there's an openness and honesty or something about you that's likable. It makes me feel good. I feel honored and, and pleased to have you share your spontaneity and your moment right now. Definitely. Um, I guess one of the things is that with my, with my story, you know, mm -hmm. about my life and everything I've been through, I think that there's a lot of other people who can benefit from my words of wisdom and tranquility and everything I can give. And if, and, <clears throat> And when I'm here giving my attention to you, Don, I feel 
connected because I know that you're listening to what I'm having to say and I'm listening to what you're having to say. It's kind of like you're coming like this, I'm coming like this, and we're connected. Yeah, yeah. So we, we have that connectiveness between us. And for other people who listen to me, I definitely feel connected more with them as opposed to people who just walk past and don't listen to me. Or... It's incredible. At their tender age, this kind of depth, for one of a better way of putting it, and now the time is running out, and the time has flown by so far. Mm -hmm. It and, is. Uh, I could give this another two hours, <laughs> seven hours, be here all night. We'll do it again. Yes, yes. <laughs> we'll some more, because I want you on again in the future. I'm not sure how soon that will be, but we will stay in touch, hopefully. Definitely. I, I do have a lot of other things to talk about, and yes, yes. So let's let you look at the red camera and uh, tell the viewers anything you want to tell them about anything, your life or what's going on between you and I tonight or anything else. That Take uh, 30 seconds or a minute or so to, to tell the viewers something. Thank you for watching. I hope that this short little video, this short interview here has given you a slight intuition and is potentially helpful and to whatever to whatever you are going through and and good luck with all your future endeavors and thank you for being tuned in <laughs> thank you so much for coming thank you, on You're delightful okay? thank you thank you now let me see about a public public service the aclu i'm a member of the american civil liberties union because the aclu is so terribly important some people don't like the aclu i love it and to learn how to end corporate personhood, I'm, I'm political, as you know. Corporate, corporate personhood is, is a bad deal. Corporations are not persons, and money is not speech. And uh, thanks for watching. Remember KFC, uh, not Kentucky Fried Chicken, Dr. Don's KFC. Uh, kind, friendly, and charitable. Those are the three things. Be kind, be friendly, and be charitable to you, too and a very special guest this evening. Thank you. Thanks again.